text this afternoon is Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And uh, before we dive into the text, uh, I want to open up the time with a question, something to think about. Uh, the question is, is ambition ever okay? Is ambition good, bad? What do you think about that? It's one of the great ethical values in the world. As far as the world is concerned, it's awesome. It's, there is no better red-blooded American success story than the poor person, you know, who by ambition and hard work pulls himself up by his bootstraps and makes himself rich. That's a good American story, right? Many people consider ambition to be the mark of a good person, especially like young people, if they're in school or, you know, getting ready for a career, somebody who's ambitious, somebody who knows what they want. That's a, that's a good person. That's somebody who has a lot going for them, right? In worldly terms, especially considering the freedom that we enjoy here in America, you can make it whatever you want of yourself. Ambition is roughly equal to potential. Your life can be whatever you're willing to make it. You're as much or as little as you make of yourself. That's the American dream, right? And there's a lot that's been said about ambition. Sir John Denham said, ambition is like love, impatient of both delays and rivals. Stephen Brust said, a young man without ambition is an old man waiting to be. Thomas Otway said, ambition is a lust that is never quenched, but grows more inflamed and madder by enjoyment. And William Shakespeare, the only one of the four, I actually recognize the name William Shakespeare, famously said the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. So there's a lot of perspective, good and bad, but in general, ambition is celebrated right up there with intelligence and athleticism as one of the things that makes you great. Does that sound about right? And if we're honest, I think that sort of greatness is something we want. I, I want it at a very deep level. We want to be like that. We want people's attention or respect or admiration. We want to feel good about our successes and what we've done with our lives. We want to be somebody. And when you spend as much time in Christian circles as I have, I've grown up a Christian, um, it definitely starts to feel like ambition is kind of a dirty word. We don't, we don't throw that around very much. It has the connotation of selfish people grabbing for money or pleasure or power or whatever it is they want. And to be honest, that's fair. A lot of people have hurt a lot of people and themselves in the single-minded pursuit of whatever, whatever it is they think is going to make their lives worth it. But ambition, just in itself, ambition isn't bad or wrong. We can't run away from ambition any more than we can run away from pleasure. That's just something that's part of our lives as humans. That kind of pseudo-holiness saying, no, I'm not going to do that, it puts a burden on us and everybody else that no one's able to bear. So that's not the way we want to look at it. When we consider this idea of ambition, what we're talking about is the strong desire, this is how it's defined, the strong desire for the achievement of a goal, especially one that requires hard work and dedication. That's not a bad thing, is it? It's good and right. It's as natural as hunger. God has made humans to be ambitious, and some more than others. I'm not a terribly ambitious person, but some, some people are, just naturally. That's not a problem. What matters is what the goal is. What we consider to be success is what matters about us. Of all the quotes I looked up about ambition, I think the best one for our consideration today is Marcus Aurelius. He said, a man's worth is no greater than the worth of his ambitions. It's very important that we are ambitious for the right things. We should be aiming, we should be working hard and praying and thinking about accomplishing something truly important, something eternal. So we started with the question, is ambition ever, ever okay? Absolutely it is. We should strongly desire real success. We should be willing to put in hard work and dedication for it. But we shouldn't be obsessed with one-dimensional worldly success like financial independence or attractive appearance or athletic competitiveness. 
And instead, we can take a cue from Paul's letter to the Colossians that we're about to open up. Because in our text today, the apostle realize, relays his thanksgiving and prayer for the believer's real success. A real, eternal, spiritual achievement of something good. So as we open up to the very beginning of Colossians today, we're going to consider exactly what real godly success looks like. That is, what godly Christian ambition is looking to achieve. So I've titled this message, Godly Christian Ambition. Again, we're in the beginning of Colossians, and we're going to look at, uh, broken it down into four parts. We'll look a little bit at the background, and then we'll look at a faith worth commending in verses 3 through the first part of verse 5. Then a gospel that's worth receiving in verses 5 through 8. We'll look at a life that's worth living in verses 9 through 12, and a Savior worth worshiping in verses 13 and 14. So let's start out by reading Colossians chapter 1. And uh, we're mostly going to hang out in Colossians today, not too much skipping around so you can keep it open, put your bookmark, whatever. Um, let's read Colossians 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it does also among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. It's a wonderful text, and it's a mouthful. Not only is it only two sentences when Paul originally wrote it, it's, uh, it's also a lot there, deep theology and, and uh, a lot of good truths. So um, we're going to break it down, uh, hopefully in a way that will make it a little easier to think about. First, some background uh, as we get started with this. We're going to talk about, uh, just kind of set ourselves in biblical history, uh, what this book, where this book came from. Um, we talked a little bit about this on Wednesday. It was a really great time we had together talking through some of the who and what and when and why of Colossians. Um, as it starts out in the first couple of verses, it's Paul and Timothy uh, to the church at Colossae in God our Father. We know Paul pretty well, right? He's the first main actor in the book. Uh, Paul wrote most of the epistles in the New Testament. He served as the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the one God appointed to bring the good news of the gospel uh, to the rest of the world outside of the Jews. And the, the theology that the Spirit has inspired in Paul's letters, today it's the foundation of a lot of what we believe and practice in the church. So these letters are really important. Now it was from Paul and, and Timothy, who was his associate, uh, to Colossae. Now, Colossae was a city in Phrygia in Asia Minor. That's in modern-day Turkey. Um, it's kind of interesting to look it up on a map. It was near a trade route, not close to it, so it was kind of a medium-sized, normal-ish city. It's about 10 miles southeast of Laodicea, which was a very important, very rich city right on that trade route, um, but it never really achieved the, the greatness of Laodicea. But you've heard of Laodicea. It comes up another couple of times uh, in the Bible. So 
geographically, that's what we're talking about. It's close to that. And it had a relatively new community of faithful believers. That's who Paul was writing to. Um, there was a, a large community of Jews in the uh, tri-city area of Laodicea and Hierapolis and Colossae, and a lot of those, um, as Jews did right at first, a lot of those became believers, and so there was a church. Now, the interesting thing is, Paul probably never visited Colossae. We can't be sure about that. The, the history is a little bit vague on it, but uh, it seems like it was probably during his final imprisonment in Rome that Paul heard about the faith in Colossae and wrote to them and, and wrote this letter. So what we have here, I believe, is a letter written from the Apostle Paul to a church he'd never visited with everything he wanted to say to a church he would probably never get to see. Everything that he wouldn't get to teach to them, he put in this letter. So it's, it's a cool letter. It's short, it's concise, and it's uh, very important, I think, for a church that we, like Colossae, um, never met Paul, never saw Jesus. And there's a lot we can get out of it. But it doesn't really matter if Paul was able to meet the Colossians, um, because there's no such thing as the church of Paul, after all, right? It's God's church. And that's why he greets them with grace and peace from God our Father, he says. The Apostle's Heavenly Father is the Colossians' Heavenly Father, is Jesus' Heavenly Father, and he's still our Father today. So what was written for Colossae is for us too. Now, back then in 62 AD or whenever this was written, nobody could imagine all of the people who would be reading this letter. Certainly Paul didn't think so, but the Spirit wrote this book, and the Spirit has preserved these words for our sake. So as we get into the, the meat of the book, it's worth remembering that we can read them just as if we were there, just as if we were the church in Colossae. It was written with us in mind by God himself, and, and what's taught here is good for us too. So let's get into it. First, in verses 3 through 5, we'll look at a faith worth commending. The best news I think a Christian can receive is that somebody has given their life to Christ. Amen? Amen. It's, or that somebody's continuing to live a faithful life to him. Hearing about God's work in people, it's awesome, isn't it? There's very little as satisfying as seeing new believers baptized. We've got to do that a couple of times. It's really cool. Or hearing a good report from another church or a missionary effort. You know, Rick is going to go to Nairobi and he's going to come back and tell us what the believers there are doing. It's going to be great to hear about it. Assuming God is working there. And, you know, between you and me, I think he is. Or maybe best of all, to step back and look at the growth and faithfulness in our own church and our own families and our own life. To take a second and think about what seems normal the rest of the time. It's exciting seeing what God does in people. It's one of the purest joys we have. And by the same token, it feels good when other people can see God's work in our lives too. I find it extremely encouraging to hear that my faith is visible to somebody. Because frankly, it's kind of amazing. Uh, that shouldn't have happened. People like you and me, living holy and faithful lives, it's as miraculous as the lame man picking up his mat and walking, or the blind man looking around and seeing people like trees walking around. It can't happen, and God does it anyway. It's really cool to hear that people can see that. And that kind of mutual encouragement, I see what God is doing in your life, and you see what God is doing in my life, that's exactly what we find in these opening verses of Colossians. The, the very first thing that Paul says to the Colossians is we thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we heard of your faith. Paul and Timothy commended and expressed thankfulness to God for the Colossians' church, and that sets the tone of this whole letter. And I've always felt like this epistle is kind of a breath of fresh air, because it sounds more like, keep it up, you're doing great, keep going, rather than, what's your problem, you need to fix all these things. 
not that correction and rebuke aren't good. They're super important. There's a place for them. We see them a lot in Scripture. Uh, but there's not a ton of it in Colossians. And this opening of Thanksgiving reminds us how important normal, just regular, boring, daily striving in faith really is. Paul, the great apostle, was thankful for the Colossian church just doing it, just doing normal life in faith. It's always worth taking a minute to step back and, and thank God for his work of faith in our own hearts, in the people we know and love, and in people we hear about, even the people we don't know or have never met. It's worth a lot. It's, it's good for a lot of worship. It's worth noting that the context of this Thanksgiving, he doesn't say we prayed for you one time. He says when we pray for you. This is something that happens all the time. Regular prayer was important to the apostles. And it was to all the early church, and it should be to us today. Acts 2.42, you remember, mentions that all the believers devoted themselves to prayer, along with teaching and fellowship and communion. That's what they did together. And at the same time, we remember in Acts 6 that positions of practical service, kind of the first uh, deacons or deacon-like positions, were appointed so that the apostles could specifically put their time towards prayer and teaching. This is a good example for us to follow. With as much time as each of our roles allow, some of us are busier than others. Some of us have jobs, we're pretty busy. Some of us are moms, we're even busier. But with whatever time we have, we should be devoted to prayer for ourselves, for each other, and as in this passage, for other faithful churches and believers, whoever the Lord lays on our hearts. Just as an aside, this one's for free, uh, I am proud and impressed and very thankful for uh, the way Reggie leads this church in prayer. Um, he prays for us, he prays for all of us every week. If you didn't know that, he does, it's awesome. And, and he sets an example for us to be devoted to prayer and leads the prayer meetings and um, things like that. It's it's very good, very blessed to have a pastor who sees the priority of that, and it's good for us um, to recognize how important it is and, and carry on with that. So, in the normal daily prayers, Paul gives thanks for this church at Colossae, for their faith, for their love, and for their hope. And I want to take a minute to think about these things. We'll read it. He says, we're thankful. Uh, verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So first, uh, we're giving thanks for the Colossians' faith. Very simply, their faith was in Christ Jesus. It's the fact that they believe in Jesus is the faith that we're talking about. All down the ages, this has been the defining attribute of God's people all defined in the scripture. That's always what it comes back to, is faith. For Abraham, who, quote, believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, that's Galatians 3, 6. It was all about faith. That's what made him God's son, God's chosen one. From, from Abraham in the kind of the forefather of our faith all the way to Jesus' teaching that everyone believes in him, the Son of God, will not perish but have eternal life, John 3.16. It's all about faith. That's what makes you gods. There have only ever been two kinds of people, those who believe in God and those who don't. And that distinction crosses every other barrier, whether a religious sect or denomination or ethnic group or social class Nothing else matters, like faith in God or not. That's why it says a couple of chapters later, here in Colossians, along the same lines as Galatians, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Gentile, slave or free, of the circumcision or not, man or woman, what matters is you're in Christ. That is the defining feature of the Christian. That's where we get the name, right? It makes sense. It was faith in Christ. And what does the faith look like that the Colossians displayed? This faith is 
I say this because there's a kind of an important question for me. We hear faith, faith, faith all through the Bible, and it's worth remembering what, what is faith? What are we talking about? It's when God makes a promise. Like the promise he made to Abraham, leave your home for this unknown land. You don't know it yet, but I'm going to take you there. I'm going to bless you, make you great, bless the world through you. That's a promise, and Abraham believed it. Or like the promise that God made through Isaiah by his wounds, talking of the, the Savior, the suffering servant who would come by his wounds, we are healed. God makes promises all through Scripture, and it's taking what God says and believing it so deeply that you actually live like it's true. You make choices as if it's a true thing. What God promised is going to happen. So for the Christian, faith is kind of broad that way. For the Christian, it's specifically the hearing the message of the gospel. We hear that Jesus died for us so that God is willing to forgive everything we did wrong, even though we hated him and loved everything bad. We hear that even now when we do wrong, his forgiveness is so great and Jesus' righteousness is so complete that we can get back up. We can confess what we did wrong, we can repent and carry on trying to do better. We hear that God's love for his own son is actually God's love for us too and nothing can break it. And believing these things is not some great act it's just saying to yourself, yeah, okay, I think that's true, I'll take it, I'll go with that. It's important never to forget, and this is stressed all through the New Testament, we can never forget that that's what makes us Christians. It's faith, believing what God has said. It's not this creed or that practice, how we do church, it's not the traditions of family, and it's not the fresh ideas of youth. It's not our involvement in some social issue that's important to us. It's not our application of some economic principle that seems sound. Believing the gospel about Jesus is what makes us who we are. And we never move past that. We move deeper into it, but we never go beyond it. A lot of people from the earliest of times have tried to make Christianity something more than plain faith. It's, and it's, it's easy. It's tempting to think that you know more or you have the right sort of lifestyle, whatever that means to you. Everybody from Judaizers back then to Jehovah's Witnesses now have tried to tack on some extra requirement to the scriptures and that makes you a better sort of believer. But there's no better sort of believer. It's a simple faith. Believing the gospel and living like it's true. It's important to keep reminding ourselves of this faith and the simplicity of it and encouraging each other in it and, and reminding each other to avoid adding anything to it. We grow into faith in Jesus. We never grow out of it. So the Colossians had this faith and that was the, the, the main defining thing in their lives. But what sort of life is it that the Christian faith, the faithful Christian grows into? Right here in, in this text, what the Colossians' faith actually looked like was love. Love for all the saints. Love is the clearest mark of Christian faith that there can ever be. If your faith is in God's love, if God says, I love you, and you believe it, that's faith, then love becomes the rhythm and language of your life. John the Apostle, remember, wrote at length about this kind of love in First and Second John, and I wish we had time to meditate on that, but uh, a couple of verses are going to have to do. Let's read 1 John 4, 10 through 12. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. God's love for us, if we really believe it, if we really take it into ourselves, it becomes our love for each other. And the reason, I think, for that is because God's love gives us a great security. His spirit works in us. He gives us everything we need, so we don't need 
to take and grab and, and pull the world into ourselves. Secure people can be good to other people. Loved people can love. The world knows this. We see this naturally, and it's at its most true when, when you're ultimately loved by God. And you're able and committed to love other people. This is Jesus' own definition of faithfulness. He said in John 13, 35, Everyone will know by this that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So what does this Christian sort of love looks like? Clearly it's important. And I think there's a few facets to this kind of love. First, uh, it means we really care about each other. We think about each other. We're, you know, you guys are on my mind and I'm on yours. We enjoy spending time together and sharing our lives. If I have an excuse to get out of meeting with fellow believers, I don't always take it because I actually like having time together. We feel for each other. As it says in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We feel what our fellow believers feel. We really care about them. But it goes deeper than that, if possible. It also means we're willing to make sacrifices for each other. We show deference to each other, um, choosing somebody else's good first. Philippians 2, 4 says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Why? Because Jesus did. That's how Jesus treats us. He was God. He could have done whatever he wanted, and he gave up absolutely everything out of love for us. Real Christian love also entails truth. If we do really care about each other, it's important that we're honest with each other, because if we care about each other, we want each other to know what's true and have the best uh, information and truth available. Not only is every strong relationship built on personal honesty, again, this is something that the world understands, that we have to be honest with each other, like about ourselves, to have a relationship with anybody. But beyond that, what maybe the world doesn't understand is that we also have to be honest about the truth, the, the big truth, as Ephesians has it, speaking the truth in love, that's what builds us all up together in Christ. So we have to share ourselves, our own hearts, be honest about ourselves, but we also have to share Christ with each other and be honest about the truth as we see it in Scripture. That's what builds us up, and that's what's really loving to each other. And when we have this kind of love, it isn't the sort of thing that comes and goes. Christian love shows great loyalty. Lots of people think they're loyal. People will be loyal to their families or to their companies or to their gangs or whatever. But they don't understand true loyalty because true loyalty, again, is what God has shown us. What causes our love isn't our convenience or our circumstances. It comes out of God's love and that love never changes. God is completely faithful, completely loyal to us. And that's why we see such loyalty in the church when people are actually loving each other well. It never stops. It never breaks. It never goes away. Not until God's love goes away. I don't see that happening anytime soon. That's why when Christian faith is lived out really well, we see that in local bodies and even across miles and oceans and years, we see the New Testament saints caring about each other and praying for each other and working hard for each other's good. I don't know of anything else that has the power to cause worship and thankfulness to God so much as godly love for other saints. And if there's anything that's going to build up our church and going to show Jesus Christ to the rest of the world, it is love based on that faith, faith in the gospel. So we see, back to Colossians, that faith defines the Christian. It works itself out in love. And both of them come from one source. The hope laid up for us in heaven. Uh, verse 5. It says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. That's what 
causes the love and faith in, in the Christian heart. This is important. You can't manufacture a faithful, loving life. You can't make it happen because you want to be a good Christian. I've tried and I've seen a lot of people trying and you cannot do it. You can pretend. You can look like it. That's not called faithfulness. It's called hypocrisy. It doesn't fool God and if it fools people, it's only for a little while. The truth always comes out. People see who you are and then it's worse than it was before. You don't want to pretend to be a faithful, loving Christian. The only source of real love and the only foundation of persistent faith is eternal hope. I wish I could say that I have the grit to do what's right. That I could just man up, buckle down, and do what I know I should. That seems really strong and manly and good to me. I would like that. Reality is that's not how faith works. Faith isn't based on me and how well I can do. And thank God, because I can't do very much. Faith is based on how good God is. Me, I need something to keep me going. I don't know about you guys, but generally that motivation for me comes from other people being happy with me. I know people, psychology or whatever, says that people have different motivations, but I think that's important for everybody. When somebody's happy with you, somebody you care about, that keeps you going, whether it's a boss you respect, or a teacher that you really like, or a child you care about, or your husband or wife whom you love so much and you... you care what they think and how they feel. I do my best when I'm doing it for someone. And just like the other things we talked about, that's not bad. There's no problem there. It's a good thing, but you have to aim it right. The ultimate, the best version of this is the desire for God to be happy with me. That's what, that's what really makes me go. One of those important promises in the gospel, we believe, is that those who respond well to God's amazing grace will one day receive the Lord's commendation. We look forward to hearing, well done, good servant. That's not to be confused with earning God's favor, not at all. But having received his favor already, having already been brought into his family by the blood of Christ, and we're in now, and we're his, and now we live to make him proud. And we should, and that's right and good. If we can keep that promise in front of us, that eternal well done from God, we'll work harder, and we'll flee sin better, and yes, we'll love God's people more and more. We have to believe the gospel, and we have to hang on to the hope we have, not just of salvation, but of God's pleasure in us and in Christ's righteousness really working itself out in our lives. We need to hope in that for faith and love to be real in our lives. Second, starting in verse 5, we'll look at a gospel worth receiving. The source of the Colossians' faith, of course, was the gospel. Sorry, in the second half of verse 5, it says, Of this you've heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. One of the things that has struck me most, uh, as I mentioned a little bit as we were talking about the background, um, is that this church at Colossae is not Paul's church, and it's not Peter's church. They didn't have the stature or the status of the church in Jerusalem. They didn't have the wealth and the power of the nearby church at Laodicea. What they had was, anybody want to guess? The word of God, yes. All that was necessary for the inception and growth of a faithful, genuine Christian church was the word. Just the word of God. The, the true gospel of Jesus. That's all they needed. I'm going to steal from Reggie here for a little bit because he says this all the time and I've come to believe it very strongly. God's words 
were, cre- what, were what created in the beginning, and God's words in Scripture by the Holy Spirit are what create life in each individual believer's heart. God's words are what do the work. And in the same way, it was God's words in the gospel that created this church in Colossae and that create every church, every real faithful church. It's God's word, words that do the work. You know, one of my favorite things about our church here is how little we all have in common. There is almost nothing the same about any of us. DC, Marvel, case in point. That's all I have to say. And you know I'm not cool enough to be any else friend, right? There's no reason we should know each other or hang out together. But we have everything in common because our church is built on this word of the truth, the gospel. We share our lives because that word is all that matters. Now, I think it impressed Paul that the gospel was growing and bearing fruit throughout the world. That this thing that started off as just a a simple message from a few people was taking off. It is seriously impressive that the church grew and spread like it did, like wildfire, all over the world without any leader or figurehead moving it forward. The only leader it had had been killed. It's amazing how fast the church spread and grew. It's a testament to the work of the Holy Spirit. And what we see is that the Holy Spirit, that Jesus himself come back to life and living now in every believer, is the figurehead of the movement. He's the one leading it and making it happen. And it's always cool, it's impressive to see what happened through Acts and in the New Testament, but things really are no different today. It, it can be hard to see when we live in such a, right now we're in a really strongly post-Christian uh, social and political climate. There's not a lot of love given to Christians anymore in our world. And especially when every worldly power would have you think that Christianity is done with, or at least losing steam. People want to think that that's for the last generation, nobody's really about that anymore. But the reality is that here, in, in this city and in this country and around the world, the church is still growing and bearing fruit, it's still spreading exactly the same way and for exactly the same reason. The Holy Spirit is still working and doing this amazing work. And it's exciting. It's invisible. You don't get to see it very much, but sometimes you get little hints and suggestions that pockets of true believers are going strong in every corner of humanity. Maybe never gaining influence in the world, maybe never getting famous, maybe never writing anything about it, maybe nobody ever knows they're there, but bearing important fruit nonetheless. That's what we're doing. That's what churches all over the world are doing, and I can't wait to see what it comes to, because... I can't possibly fathom what God is doing in this great work that spans so many generations, eons, and cultures, and continents. When we see it all come together, it's going to be awesome. And we're going to worship. We're going to be worshiping Jesus for what he's doing now, forever. And the church is growing not just in number and in scale, but also in depth and maturity. In verse 6, It says, uh, in the whole world it's bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it. Since you understood the grace of God in truth. At the same time as the church increases and bears fruit on a global scale, it also increases and bears fruit in each congregation and in each person. You know, I'm going to take a little sidetrack for a second. I've always been impressed that humanity, human beings, uh, seem to be kind of right in the middle of the road, cosmically, right? We're kind of a, in a Goldilocks place here. Not too big, not too small. You look normal size to me. But compared with the whole Earth, we're you know, tiny. Nothing specks. You can't even see us. And our Earth is barely a rock compared to the Sun, and the Sun is a little pinpoint of light in actually kind of an average-sized galaxy. And that galaxy is one of millions of millions, not millions and millions, millions of millions of galaxies that we know of. 
that make up this vast, complex, astounding universe. And all of it moving and working together in ways we can't even start to think about. And as if that isn't enough, the heavens declare the glory of God, but that's not the only thing that does. If you put away the telescope and take out the microscope, you and I are made up of cells that we can't even see. Constantly working and dying and being replaced and doing their cell thing. And those cells are made up of millions and millions of molecules. They're made up of atoms, which are not, in case you thought they were, made up of solid masses, but instead it's another leap of scale down to the subatomic particles that make up the atoms and give them their properties and make them do what they do. And those are made up of something else, but God only knows because we haven't figured out how to bang them together hard enough to see what's inside. We don't even understand how big and how small this world is that God has made. It'll blow your mind. It's worth thinking about a little bit sometimes. Sit under the stars or look in a microscope and just worship. And it's sort of the same, what God is doing with his people. You know, I live my life and I have a few friends, and I live in days, moments, years. That's just a tiny piece of it. In God's mind, every moment in every life matters. Every life connects, every moment matters to all the other ones. And the way God works it all together adds up to a history that is as spectacular as it is complex. And God will be glorified in the end of it. So the cool thing is that we don't have to be missionaries traveling the world. We don't have to be evangelists holding huge rallies or conferences. We don't have to have massive revival tours and touch thousands of lives and work on a global scale to be part of God's work. Nobody ever has to see it for you to be part of God's work. We're actually just as important in what God is doing when we do little faithful things just today, when we speak God's truth to one person, to a friend, to a coworker, to a parent, or to a child, especially to children, because they listen, when we love or do good to somebody, when we take a single thought captive or win out against temptation by God's power for just one more minute, we're just as important to this this ginormous work that God is doing through the whole world, throughout history, we're just as important as that single little cell is to the whole body. Only God can hold it all together by the word of his power. But because he does, it all matters. So this, this work among God's people is growing, it's thriving, it's impressive, definitely worth mentioning and, and commending and worshiping for, and I think it's great that Epaphras is mentioned. We see in verse 7, it says, You learned it, the gospel, from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Epaphras is a cool guy. You know him? He brought the gospel to the church at Colossae. His name comes up a couple of other times in the New Testament. And he's always helping, bringing good news of how people are doing, bringing gifts from one group to another. He's striving in prayer for people. And you know who knows about Epaphras? Nobody. He's just a normal guy who cared a lot about God's people, who preached the word just like he had heard it, to whoever he was around. He worked hard. And he got to be a part of a really great work. I like this letter to Colossae because, like I mentioned, it's not a first-generation apostolic church. They didn't, they didn't know the people who knew Jesus. It wasn't uh, founded by apostles. And our church isn't either. We have that in common with them. They're Gentiles, and so are we. They had Epaphras 
It was just a normal guy who shared the word, word faithfully with them. We have Reggie who shares the word faithfully with us. That's exactly what a church needs, is, is leaders and involved people who care about the church and each person in it, who help out however they can, who pray earnestly. And it's also exactly what each of us can be. We can't make ourselves talented. We can't make ourselves smart. We can't make ourselves fast. Some of us can turn on the charm. I am not one of those people. But what we can do is faithfully pass on what we've believed. And we can all care about our fellow Christians. When Epaphras brought back, when he, when he brought the gospel to the Colossians, he also brought back a report about them. He told Paul and Timothy about their love in the Spirit. And it also struck me that without that report, without, Epaph without Epaphras telling Paul and his folks who were with him what was going on, this, this passage, this letter, never would have happened. It's good to talk each other up sometimes, not for the sake of vanity or flattery, but to freely share and celebrate what God is doing is a really good encouragement to everyone who hears it. We can all be part of God's work, and we can all encourage each other with the work that God is doing in the other believers in our lives. So last, as we come to verses 9 through 14, and I was wrong, I'm going to make this the last point, we're going to look at a, a life worth living. So, once the Colossians heard and believed the gospel, the Spirit worked faith in their hearts, they're showing love to each other, the lives are defined by the hope of heaven, they've arrived, right? That's great, that's what the Christian life is supposed to be. So there they are, they're, they're, they're all set. They're saved from hell. Paul can move his attention on to the next town full of heathens. Sound good? No? No. The day they heard about this new faithful church, it was the start of something, not the end of it. Like so many good works, this work at Colossae was one birthed and bathed in prayer and in sharing his prayer and deepest hope for the Colossian church, Paul gives us a snapshot of what we can be praying for and striving for in our own hearts, in our families, and in our church. So first, verse 9, it says, So from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. The first thing it was asked on behalf of this young church is knowledge. Not just any knowledge, not a broad and well-rounded education, if you will, but a targeted expertise in the will of God. Knowledge and wisdom are an important theme all through the scriptures, right? The Proverbs instruct us uh, that wisdom is supreme, so acquire wisdom, and whatever you acquire, acquire understanding. It's Proverbs 4, 7. It also reminds us that the beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord, and acknowledging the Holy One is understanding. For because of wisdom, your days will be many, and years will be added to your life. That's Proverbs 9, 10, and 11. Wisdom and, and fearing God and knowing God is very important through the Scripture. And Actually, the last message I preached was on that theme of wisdom in Solomon's life and all through the rest of the Scripture. So if you want to look deeper at it, you can go back and listen to that one. But for now, right here, see the spiritual wisdom, that rare treasure so highly regarded in Scripture, it's roughly equivalent to knowing God's will. That's really what it's about for the Christian's life. Because if we truly love God, if we have that kind of faith that we've just been talking about, we know God's love, we really want him to be proud of us, we, we need to know how to please him. We need to know what to do, what our lives should be like, so that we can achieve that. How do we do that? Well, knowing the answer to that question, that is spiritual wisdom. As an aside, if somebody tries to convince you that wisdom is something else other than this, no. In scripture, this is spiritual wisdom, is knowing what God wants based on what he has said, and knowing how to put that into real life. That's wisdom. 
And the answer is, uh, it's really not a great mystery. We absolutely need the working of the Holy Spirit in us so we can understand God's will, but when he does, the way he reveals it to us is actually just the plain reading of the word he's already given us. I've heard it said before, you know, comedians will, will quip and whatnot, how impossible it is for a husband to understand his wife, right? Women are just a mystery to us. They'll say, you'll never know what she's thinking, no matter what you try to do. Well, it's funny, and I'll laugh along with everybody, but if you really think about it, it's kind of stupid. Because the reality is that if you listen to your wife and wives, if you pay attention to your husbands, it's not that hard to find out what's going on with them. You, just, you have to actually listen to them. Which, granted, it's, it's not that easy because we're all pretty selfish. But it is that simple. You just listen. You pay attention to what they're saying and how, and you can get to know somebody pretty well. Knowing God is a lot like that. It's God's will is this great mystery. It's this thing that no mortal can ever hope to understand, except that he told us. And if you read this book, if you read what's in here and listen to it taught and quit telling it what you think and just pay attention, it's not that complicated. My five-year-old understands most of the important things in this book. She has a lot to learn, but it's just, it's simple. It's just hard. And it takes faith. And, and we don't want to hear what it says sometimes, naturally, as people. So Paul made a habit of praying for the Lord's help, which is something we all need. Help knowing God's will. We need help to listen honestly to God's word, to humbly and obediently take it for what it says. We need God to give us spiritual wisdom, not to reinterpret the word of God, not to make it say what we want so that we don't have to change our lives, but to know how to apply it so we can change our lives. And our lives do change when we have this wisdom. If we carry on reading verse 10, we get wisdom and understanding. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. When we apply this spiritual wisdom that God gives, and if he does give it when we ask, that's promised in James. You begin to bear fruit. You're doing more and more good works. You know God deeper and deeper. This is one of the really amazing things about the Christian life is that people really can change. How often has this question been debated? Can people change? Does somebody ever really change? In questions of justice and civil corrections, it comes up all the time. Can you actually change somebody? In issues of broken trust and wrongdoing, somebody has betrayed somebody else and, and it has to be asked, can they ever change? How often have you berated yourself or somebody else stuck in some sin, you're never going to change, you'll always be like this. Because it really does look that way most of the time. Left to ourselves, that, that's pretty much how we are. Countless words have been spent addressing this question of whether a person can get better. And basically the thinking falls into one of two camps in the world. A, people are basically good, and with the right help and care and adjustment, we can bring out their potential make them into good, upstanding citizens. Or B, some people are basically evil. Lots of people are good, but some people are bad. And there's nothing you can do about that. What the Word of God brings to the table is the amazing option C. All people are basically evil. We are all bad. And there's nothing you can do about it. But God's work, by His Word and empowered by His Spirit, can change a person to become truly good. It's super encouraging to me to know that as we know God's will, as we apply spiritual wisdom, as we read the book, 
and we're honest before God about what it says, we're not stuck in a rut or an infinite loop of sin, always repeating the same confession and being forgiven, but it comes back again. Repentance and forgiveness over and over and over again. It's like a bad dream sometimes. And sometimes it lasts a long time, but not forever. We're actually going somewhere. We are growing, increasing, bearing more and more fruit as God is working in our lives. If you believe the gospel, if you're just willing to take it, God actually does this work. This is a truly hopeful perspective, not necessarily on humanity as a whole, but on God's people in our own lives. We can change, we are changing for the better. It's not easy though, is it? I don't think so. I don't think Paul thought so. Because the next thing he prays for, verse 11, is that they'd be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Paul prays for power from God for endurance by God's God's own glorious might. I see this phrase for endurance. And I'm like, what? I thought we were having a good time here. Growing, getting wise, fruits and whatnot. This is good. Why are we talking about endurance? I don't like endurance very much. If you didn't know that about me, that's something you have to know about me. I don't like endurance. I work out sometimes, right? Try to stay in shape and whatnot, go to the gym. And when I'm picking a workout routine, there are basically two types of workouts. Okay? There's strength, kind of side of the workout game, which is like, yeah, cool, I'm going to lift some weights, do some push-ups or squats or something. It's going to feel good. It's going to be all chill and nice and have a good time. And there's endurance, which is like, now go run up a mountain and jump rope for like 10 minutes and do burpees until you start coughing up blood. I don't like endurance workouts. Why? Because they're hard. And they keep going for a long time. I wish this wasn't true, but if you want to get better, if you want to be in shape, if you want to be physically stronger, if you want to be smarter in school, if you want to be better at your job, or yes, bearing fruit in Christ is hard work. And it doesn't stop. That's why we have to pray for endurance. If what you're doing is worthwhile, it'll never be easy. You'll get breaks here and there, ups and downs. God gives us the rest we need, but good work, good work will wear you out. This is true if you're holding down a job, doing the daily grind, making a living for your family. It's true if you're stuck at home with the tiny little crazy people trying to teach them, and show them love, and keep them fed somehow because they eat constantly. This is true if you're saying no to sin, even when Saying no doesn't make you want the sin any less. This is true when you're counseling one person after another who really doesn't want to hear what you have to say because they just like what they're doing and don't want to stop. It's true when you're trusting Jesus in the middle of hardship like sickness or stress. These things wear us out. Always, and there's nobody strong enough to endure through them. It's really hard. And that's why we ask for God's help. Thankfully, the kind of endurance God gives is not the kind where you just bite the bullet and get through it. This prayer is for endurance with patience and joy. Can you imagine going some of those going through some of those things? I just mentioned we're all going through at least one of those. Can you imagine going through that when it's really hard and having joy? Me neither. A lot of times. It doesn't really make sense. But that's what Paul prayed for the Colossians. And I really think that's what we're supposed to ask for ourselves and for each other. I genuinely, genuinely believe that if we seek God for help with endurance in these things, we don't just tough it out because I'm the man, I can do this. 
but we seek God in them, I think we will increasingly find patience with joy right in the middle of it. And there's an important reason for that joy. If we keep reading in verse 12, it says, Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The joy that we have as Christians, the patience with which we endure, it's not just putting a smile on your face because that's what Christians are supposed to be like. No. What causes us joy, even when we're trying to endure something that's really hard, is thankfulness. The last really awesome thing Paul shares in his prayer for the Colossians is thankfulness to the Father. What for? He's qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness. He's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. And in his Son, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Do you ever forget what God has done for you? I do. I did, I think. When I was writing this sermon, I didn't feel the joy that I knew I ought to be feeling writing it. I was just kind of taking it out of faith because I see what it says. I can't really change that. I don't always feel it. I don't always remember. But it doesn't change the fact that God has done it. We were sinners. We were slaves in the kingdom of darkness. We were animals. Just following our cravings all the time and trying to survive. And he lifted us up out of that dark place and put us where only Jesus belongs. Right next to himself. It's worth stopping for a minute. Are we so often? And looking back on where you've come from because it is a dark, dark place. If you didn't start off in a, a truly deplorable state, sorry, you don't belong here. We, we were bad people. It's worth looking at that and looking around at where God has put you now because it's incredible what his mercy has done for us. Now, if you're like me and you're tempted sometimes to feel pretty good, pretty awesome, like a pretty good person. Take a break sometimes and think about how little you deserve to be re redeemed. At best, at your best, you were still a Gentile. Both literally, I don't think there are any Jews here, and in your heart. Outside the nation, unchosen, no business in God's kingdom. But God's mercy through Jesus brought you in and there's nothing left but to be thankful. Now, on the other hand, if you're the sort of person who's tempted to think God couldn't see you this way as his beloved and adopted son or daughter because you really don't feel it, take a minute to remember that he still did it. He doesn't actually need you to feel it, to have done it. He did it just on his own power. Jesus' death and resurrection actually happened. He really did forgive you and invite you in. And if you're a believer, you really did accept that invitation at one time, and now there's nothing left but to carry on that way and to be thankful. If we can hold on to these great truths, if only for a moment, we will have true joy, no matter what we're going through, no matter how hard it is to live this Christian life. Worship and thankfulness are both the foundation and the pinnacle of our lives as Christians, and we should practice these things, and we should exhort our fellow saints to them, and we should pray for them, for ourselves and for each other, just like the Apostle did here. So let's tie it up with a bow. We talked about ambition, how it's all about what you're trying to succeed about, what you're trying to succeed at, what is important to you. And that's exactly what we've seen in these verses. This is an ambitious text. Paul has really high hopes for the church as he's praying for them. 
And the cool thing is, when we pray a prayer like this, we have every reason to expect that God is going to answer it. Are you ambitious? Do you want success? Do you want it really bad? Do you want to see rich, godly, joyful worship in your own life and the lives of the people you care about? I've never really been the ambitious sort. But when I look at things that way, this is an ambition I can get behind. This is something I wouldn't mind putting my life into. Working hard for, taking real risks to see it happen. Because it's worth it. And of all the things I want in life, I can't think of anything better than to know at the end that it was worth it. This is a work. What Paul is describing in these short verses, this is a work that's worth it. If we do want this, if we really want to thrive the way Paul hoped and prayed for the Colossians, I think we start in the same place. We pray for it. We never stop praying for it. And then we work for it. Reminding each other of the word, of the truths in the scripture, encouraging each other, loving each other, deeply in our hearts and also practically, trying to walk in holiness ourselves, and correcting each other when we see what's wrong according to the scripture. And the really cool thing is that when we fail... Not if, because we will. We don't freak out about it, because we already started off as failures. When we first believed in God's forgiveness, we were already failing. So we hadn't lost anything. His grace frees us up to repent, to try again, to do better, to carry on growing. And that's what I really hope to see in my life, in your lives, in our church, in our city. So let's pray for these things, for our own church. And let's thank God for giving us by his Holy Spirit this love and hope and faith in the gospel that's bearing fruit and increasing all over the world. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for uh, your words to the Colossians and that we get to see them now and be part of the same work that you're doing. Thank you for creating faith in us by your Holy Spirit and sustaining us. Thank you for this body of believers and the, the love we get to share in Christ. And I do pray for these things for us, for our little church, for Gospel Community Church. God, I pray this. I pray that we would be filled with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That we would walk in a manner that's worthy of you. That we would please you and bear fruit in every good work and increase in knowing you. I pray for strength with your power according to your glorious might for endurance, for patience with joy in, in the, the truly hard things that we're going through. pray for thankfulness in all of our hearts and we give you thanks God for qualifying us when we were not qualified for, for letting us share in the inheritance of the saints for bringing us out of darkness and into light help us live that way help us be grateful all the time bless our lives and our week and our fellowship in Jesus name Amen